time and your attention to this particular case. I know it's been very long. However, as stated at jury voir dire, Mr. Elsie was indicating that this case was based upon circumstantial evidence. I disagree. His whole case is based upon theories, hypotheses, innuendos, assumptions, gut feelings, hairs on the back of your neck, but without evidence to prove that in fact Jalen Brazier caused the death of Zion Foster. Now we do know that Zion Foster unfortunately is not here. However, we have to look back into the history of the situation. First and foremost, we've heard from Zion Foster's mother, Sierra Milton, who testified numerous times. At one point in time, at a preliminary examination, she testified that she couldn't remember whether or not Zion Foster was on antidepressants or had seen a psychiatrist for depression. Repeatedly, she was asked of this. She indicated she couldn't remember. And with a little bit of arm twisting, she said, oh yes, let me be honest, I remember taking her. Months before this particular incident. Now how can somebody forget taking their daughter to a psychiatrist for depression? There had to be some serious enough issues that Zion Foster was facing in order for her to go there. Now we're not suggesting that Zion killed herself. That was never a theory of the defense, that Zion killed herself that night. But it does go to her state of mind. The prosecution would like you to believe that she was a totally healthy individual. No, she wasn't physically healthy, and unfortunately she wasn't mentally healthy at the time. Now there was testimony that she had been molested or, or raped, and her family knew about it. Allegedly, they believed her, but they never went to the police. So this would affect her state of mind. She ran away multiple times. At one point in time, for two months. And her own mother indicated that she didn't even know the friend that well she was staying with. Who knows what she's doing over there? Who she's interacting with? What type of drugs she's doing over there? If she's having seizures over there to not be observed. How would she know? She's not there. We asked her, do you know what type of substance could have been in her marijuana? Did you check it? No, I never checked her marijuana. Did you administer her prescription medication to her at the exam? No, I didn't. Did you supervise her when she took her medication? No, I didn't. But when she gets in the chair in front of you, she thinks, oh yes, I administered it. I observed her. And I asked her, confronted her like, hey, with her transcript from the preliminary examination, these specific questions were asked of you, and you said no. Oh, I was confused. I don't think it's very confusing if you saw somebody take their medication and if you gave it to them. Very easy questions. So we don't know whether or not she was taking her medication, whether or not she was over, took over the dosage, whether or not she was mixing it with other substances. We don't know. However, we did hear multiple times from Vertez Gonzalez, her boyfriend. What do we know? The day she was at work, what did she state? I have the worst headache in the world. Not just, oh, my head hurts a little bit. The worst headache in the world. The qualifier, worse than any headache before. And this was prior to her leaving. She also told Vertez, don't ping me. Don't ping me. I'm at work. Don't ping me. Which she didn't want her phone going off. She then left and went over to Jalen's house. What did Jalen tell the police? What did Vertez tell the police? She sounded very tired. She sounded very tired. Very consistent with both of them. What did Dr. Lavities indicate? Some pre ictal signs of a seizure could be a headache and fatigue. 
Multiple times she went to the hospital for fatigue and headache. At one point in time, she indicated that she couldn't feel her heart. She didn't know if her heart was beating. Same thing Jaden said. Now, Dr. Lavity testified that it happens. And we all know common sense would lend us to believe and know for a fact that hospitals sometimes misdiagnose and undiagnose certain conditions. So if she's repeatedly coming to the hospital for fatigue and or headache, could be an underlying cause and it could be contributed to her having seizures that was not diagnosed. The doctor indicated that there's a very specific test that must be generated in order to see whether or not somebody is even having seizures. And that is a test where it goes on their brain waves, something that cannot be detected after death, only during. Now, whether or not she had a history of seizures, we don't know. Because obviously the doctor didn't do a thorough analysis of her medical records. She didn't even know at the preliminary examination that Zion was taking antidepressants. I had to confront her with that. And she said she didn't know. Nor did she know at the preliminary examination that Zion had a history of seizures. She said she did not know. She also indicated had she known, it would have made a difference in her opinion. Now, the prosecution wants to show you her opinion letter, but that was with insufficient and incomplete evidence based upon Zion's medical conditions and or medical records. And what do we know? After she retrieved that information, there was never a request by the prosecution and or the officer in charge to say, hey, now that we have this new information that was established at the exam, could you give another analysis, including those particular issues and the probability of that causing Zion Foster to have death? That was never asked. Why? Because they didn't want that truth to be known. Because it didn't fit their hypothesis or their theory. It's the truth. They didn't want it because it didn't fit. So therefore, that discussion was never even had by the doctor. The only reason it was mentioned by the prosecution at trial because he know it was elicited at the preliminary examination and the doctor said it was a probable cause for Zion's death of a seizure. Now, they want you to believe that, oh, Zion, if she had a seizure, even though Vertez himself said Zion told him specifically she had a history of seizures. The question was asked, were you concerned when you saw this? No, I was not concerned because I knew of a history of seizures she told me about and that she was on medication for it. And his understanding is that if she did not take the medication, the seizures would be that much worse. Dr. Lavity testify to the same thing. If somebody is not on seizure medication, who should be, it could be that much worse. She also indicated that every seizure above absent seizure, short of grand mild seizures, would be consistent with having the same characteristics. She indicated that a seizure that could cause death, somebody can attribute characteristics of their dozing off, and they could die within their seizure. She also indicated that the time for somebody dying within a seizure could be very short. It could be the time span of somebody leaving the room and walking back. Now, the prosecution wants you to believe that, oh, just because Mr. Brazier had a history of seizures, he should have known that she was having a seizure and told them that. How would he know? Some of the characteristics she described could just be a nodding off. The only type of seizures really where body uh, parts are flailing are grand mal seizures. That's not the most common seizure that a person may attribute. That may be the most common that we think of when we think of seizures. But she indicated a lot of seizures that cause death do not necessarily have those particular characteristics. Now, 
We don't know if she had a history of seizures. That could have been buried in the 638 pages. Now, the doctor tried to indicate that, oh, she didn't find this out, or there was two separate sets of medical records, and even the prosecution had to confront her and say, hey, on your original opinion letter, it says your opinion is based upon 638 pages of medical records. Correct? Yes. And if you look at this exhibit, which was her medical records, doctor, how many pages is this? 638. So did you get a second list of medical records? No, I didn't. Why would the doctor try to insinuate she did? Why would she just tell the truth at first that, hey, I, I didn't look through it. I didn't do my job thoroughly. When I made my opinion, I just leisurely browsed browse through the medical records, didn't take the time and effort to give you an accurate opinion based upon my thorough analysis and review of the records. No, she tried to insinuate that I had or she had other records that were sent to her, which was false. Now, the prosecution wants you to believe that Mr. Brazier had some deep gash on him with blood squirting out, even though we heard from Katrina that this cat was boxed off, sanctioned off, quarantined off from children and other people because this cat had a propensity and a history of scratching people. She said this. Now, I don't know why Sergeant Jones wouldn't take pictures of Jalen of telling him to take his clothes off and take photographs. If this dad gash was so deep as they want you to believe, he'd still have it right now. Surely he would have had it when he went to the police station. Why wouldn't they photograph him? To prove whether or not how deep this gash or was it just a scratch on him from a cat? They cannot prove this. They have the burden of proof. It's just a theory with no evidence to support that, even though they had the chance. Now, Jalen went in voluntarily to the police station with a lawyer. We've heard testimony that the lawyer repeatedly tried to contact prosecutors, multiple prosecutors, tried to contact the detective from East Point, contacted the detective from the homicide, went in, made a statement, and repeatedly said before he went, he put her in the trunk, that there was no breathing. He just showed you in his own exhibit, the breathing was not there. No form of life at all. Now, what does Sergeant Jones do? She types up a statement that's not reflective <coughs> of what he said consistently that she was not breathing, there was no heartbeat, and she takes up a statement to the contrary. While he's gone with his lawyer, and then in the presence with no video, presents this to his lawyer and Mr. Brazier, and his lawyer at the time has to say, hey, this is not what he said. This is not reflective in the statement. And had to write what really would happen during that particular interview and initial it. Now, why would she leave that key detail out? And she states that, oh, she had an opportunity to review and look at her notes before she typed up that statement, but left out that key. Why? Because it didn't fit her theory or her hypothesis. We saw videos and we saw footage, I'm sorry, we saw pictures of this particular house. Jalen said that some marijuana was in an orange jar. What did we see under the table? An orange jar consistent with being marijuana. No, nobody, nobody collected this. Nobody, no, who took the pictures then? Did the pictures take themselves? The pictures were done pursuant to a search warrant. Why wasn't this evidence collected? It was after Jason's interview with the police. It wasn't before. They want you to suggest that it was before. Sergeant Jones testified that she was there. But she tried to 
point the blame on to the FBI as to why certain things weren't collected, why certain things weren't analyzed for DNA, such as a table, upstairs, downstairs. She stated that she was the officer in charge at the time, but she was relying on the FBI or other individuals who were there. But as the officer in charge, this is, this is your job. Like, who's driving this investigation? It's like a Tesla investigation on autopilot. We then heard from the FBI agent who processed the house, who indicated this is an FBI agent. He's very thorough. He indicated there was no evidence that would suggest that any evidence was moved around or cleaned up. And I know the prosecutor is going to suggest, oh, there's something that was moved, the body. There was no evidence that suggests that Mr. Brazier tried to clean this particular scene or anything. There was no blood. There was no saliva. They have luminol to detect saliva. Hagner testified that saliva can persist, and it does persist. That's why they have luminol in order to detect it. They have alternative light source in order to detect blood. Check the carpets, check the couches, the walls, intricate little places that a person would not be able to realize. These are forensic experts. They're trained to look for details where a regular person would not know and to look to clean up or to disregard certain evidence. We also heard the processing of Jalen's car. We saw pictures of this car. This car was dirty. The trunk was dirty. Obviously, there was no attempt to discard or take anything that previously was in this particular trunk. We heard from Trooper Yunt, who testified that his dog, Jameson, who has a perfect record, never is wrong, indicated on this particular car. Never false indication at all, ever. And I asked him, if there's a situation where your dog indicates on the car, and then there's an analysis afterwards where they bring the luminol, they bring the alternative light source, they send it to the Michigan State Police Crime Lab for analysis, and no blood, no DNA, no saliva whatsoever turns up in those analysis. Could Jameson possibly be wrong? Oh, no, no, Jameson's right. Despite any, Jameson's more correct than anybody. He testified at the preliminary examination that allegedly Jameson could detect blood in one part in 12,000. That's what he said. In August, of 2023. He got up on the stand and now Jameson can allegedly detect blood one part per one million. Even though he himself stated that he's been out of work for three months or up until I guess currently. So in a span from the preliminary examination until January, roughly around January, Jameson Escalated his ability from one part 12,000 to one part one million. I said, do you have any documentation to support that? Oh, yeah, I sent that. Who did he send it? He didn't send it to me. Surely he would have sent it to the prosecutor. They would have put that on the screen. That, oh, these are Jameson's credentials. This is the documentation I received from Detective, I mean, from Trooper Yoon to substantiate his testimony. No, he's throwing numbers out there and didn't want to come clean and admit that, okay, I could be wrong. Maybe I misspoke. Maybe Jameson is not as good as I may think or hope him to be. I'm sure Jameson is very thorough in his job. And if Jameson is so thorough, why wouldn't they take the individual items out the truck and see if Jameson identified or indicated on each item? Why not take out the shirts or the clothes or the whatever's in the trunk and see if Jameson indicate on those specific items? And once those items were taken out, why wasn't those individual items analyzed with luminol? 
Why weren't those individual items analyzed with the alternative light source? Why would they turn upside down? That's what I would have done to be thorough. Maybe that didn't fit their hypothesis of what happened. Then they send this information up to Michigan State Police. Hagner testified that yes, he would have wanted these items. He would have wanted to analyze these items for blood, for DNA. Why weren't they sent? We asked the OIC, and she didn't really want to answer the question. She was saying, oh, we're part of a team, or, you know, same thing Sergeant Jones was doing, kind of trying to pass the blame. But it's like, you're the officer in charge. In charge is in your title, officer in charge. So you have the authority. Ask her a very specific question. Do you have the authority? Did you have the authority to send these up? Oh, we're part of a team. If you want to get to the truth of the matter, you analyze all the evidence. If you think something had happened, you analyze to make sure to see, in fact, if it did happen. And the only way to do that, to prove it, is with evidence, not with these theories and hypotheses that can't be supported, that could possibly have been proven one way or another if they were thoroughly analyzed. Now, the detective stated that she didn't know to ask, or she doesn't know about the different, I guess, items or tools that they have to analyze at the Michigan State Police. Like, why would, how would you not familiarize yourself with what tactics or tools they have in order to analyze? If you're the officer in charge for a detective, I mean, for, for a homicide, you would think you would know what type of tools or procedures they undergo at Michigan State Police Crime Lab in order for you to know, okay, whether or not I'm going to collect this particular item because they have this particular tool that can analyze and give me a result or probability on that. Why wouldn't you ever ask the individual, do you have a machine that can magnify? If you're looking for specific hair samples or blood samples, why wouldn't you have a machine? Now, Hagman testified at some point in time he did have that machine. Why wasn't there a, 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 a ever an inquiry about that. Surely if the OIC were to inquire, do you have such a machine? Like I asked, I'm not a detective, but it came in my mind that, hey, do you have this machine? Surely if she would have inquired about this, when they received this machine, they would have notified like, hey, yes, we have a machine, or at the very least, they would have sought out a machine. Because surely a machine like this didn't just come into existence at all. Surely this machine would have existed way prior to the inception of this particular case. Now, as far as Jalen, Jalen, like I stated, voluntarily came into the police station. When he was first confronted, he was confronted by Zion's mother, and an unknown male. Now, would he have feel threatened? <laughs> More than likely so. We heard from Katrina that she was being threatened. The mother was being threatened to the fact where they threatened to cut Katrina's baby out of her stomach just so they could make Jalen feel some type of pain. So, of course, I... I mean, I would be nervous too if somebody's threatening my family and if I go into jail, if they lock me up for whatever reason, I can't even protect my family. I can't protect my children. We heard testimony from his brother who his mother asked the brother to let Jalen and the family come over there just so that they could be out of harm's way because out of all the threats they were getting and not to mention the publicity this case was given, so of course Katrina wouldn't want her face plastered across the TV screen. Because there are individuals who are threatening her who she doesn't know their identity, but now they know her identity. Not only do they know her name, social media, how she looks. So it could just be a 
who she thinks a random stranger in the supermarket, at the gas station, at a red light, who knows her, who's targeting her, and does something. And, and who would know? Oh, I she did no did no investigation. She stated that from her understanding, it was from social media. Now they did, they dug up everything from Jalen's social media, so we know clearly she has the ability to research social media. And a potential witness is being threatened with death in a serious case, and you don't do an investigation? You don't follow up? You don't even review the interview with the mother to see? You don't check if there's any police reports on the mother at all? But then you state it's your duty because you allegedly hear on the phone call that Jalen is talking to his girlfriend and she disciplines the child and the child cries and then you contact CPS. You want us to believe that, oh, you were just so concerned this wasn't a tactic to try to blackmail her to come in and testify? Oh, we have to use our common sense. We know this was. She wasn't that concerned. If you're so concerned about Katrina and their family's well-being, you would have surely followed up on some death threats. You would have just said, oh, it's, it's, it's the police precinct's duty to do that. So you just look the other way, but you have a duty to report that wasn't even child abuse. They instantly closed this case. The, you whoop a child on the butt, of course the child is going to cry. There was no evidence that she abused this child or hit the child, you know, in the face or anything like that. It was just a tactic that the police used to try to blackmail you into getting it. So, of course, she felt intimidated. She didn't want to lose her child, so of course she's going to come in here and try to give the police what, they, what she thinks they want. She feels her freedom is in jeopardy. They just arrested her. She just got out of jail Prior to her testimony, she was arrested. For what? They didn't arrest nobody else to make them come in? She appeared at the preliminary examination? The conversations between her and Jalen were for her safety. He said, if you don't have to, don't come. Because the cameras are going to be on her. He didn't say, don't. He didn't say, reject the subpoena. And she was like, oh, they might subpoena me. Like, if you don't have to come, then don't. If you don't have to, but if you have to, meaning the subpoena's issue, then come. But I don't want you here with the family who've already threatened you, can follow you to your car. I'm caring about your well-being. Your face is being publicized on the TV screen. So he's caring about her well-being. It wasn't an attempt to not get her to come. He said, if you don't have to, Meaning, I don't want you sitting here every single day watching this trial, the stress on you, the publicity on you, and, pop and possibly the threats and harm that may come to your life. Now, at, the, at some point in time, he's in jail. Everybody's accusing him of doing this. Everybody's in their assuming and their hypothesis, even though no evidence, they're saying he did this. Everybody's pointing the finger at him. So of course he's, he's researching. Of course he's really like, dang, can I be charged with somebody's death? Like, what do you need to be charged with death? Like, I'm not charged right now, but people are saying that they're going to charge me. People are pointing the finger at me. They're accusing me. They're saying they're going to harm me. So, of course, I'm going to do some research. And then they're trying to use my statement. At first, yes, I, I told her I didn't see it because I wanted to secure my, my family. I wanted to get a lawyer before I went into the police station. So, I didn't want to tell the family right then and there, yeah, I seen her. She died here. He's not a doctor. He didn't know what happened. He didn't know what pre-existing conditions. Let the prosecutor tell you, they didn't know nobody. I, I didn't know. The doctor knew. Nobody knew about Zion's history. Now, they had a very close relationship. There's thousands of text messages between the two of them. Back and forth about multiple different issues. 
about Zion's talking about this guy, she, her, her past boyfriend, her other boyfriend, the boyfriend you dropped me off. He took her over to one of her ex boyfriend house, not for Taz. So she was dating multiple people at the time. She sends him a explicit picture and he responds like, oh, I'm not even going to open that. Now we're both scarred. But the prosecutor doesn't show you that. They don't show you the first text message that was sent by her of a naked lady. That's the type of relationship they had. They talked about smoking weed. They talked about each other's relationships. They were like friends. And a female and a male can have a relationship where they talk about a multitude of issues. Never in those thousands of texts did he say, oh, I want to do this to you. She talked about some guy giving her head or wanting to give her head about being over this guy's house and not taking a pill. He said, welcome to parenthood. They talked about a multitude of issues. They smoked multiple times. They were just that type of relationship. And then he wants to suggest that he was grooming her? Not at all. They were talking back and forth. He never said, send me a picture of you. Send me a picture. What, what are you wearing? Send me a picture of you in those uh, in that bra. Send me a picture of you in them panties. Never nothing like that. Nothing even remotely close to that. It was just like two guys. Now had she been a guy and they talked about the same things and he talking about, oh, I'm getting head. She talking about, oh, I just got head last night. If it was another guy, would he still have the same suggestion? No. But just because she's a female, He's trying to suggest that this happened? That he was grooming her? Or he had a sexual attraction to her? Absolutely not. These text messages span for years. They go back years. And never once was there any insinuation that Jaden wanted her to do some sexual act to her, to him. Or he wanted to do one to her. No evidence whatsoever. Whatsoever. He searches what happens if I recant my statement, the pros and cons. This is afterwards. He knows that the prosecution is going to show evidence of him going, to, uh, the police arriving at his house, stating that, okay, I didn't see her. Of course, this was pre-lawyer. They're going to use that against him. So he said, okay, what are the pros and cons? In other words, I mean, he's not an expert researcher. So he's not going to know the exact terms. He's going to say that they said I recanted my statement, my earlier statement to the police about not seeing her. But then I came in and I, and I told them. I told them what happened. They didn't come get me. They didn't have an arrest warrant. I came there and I told them what happened, which he did, which he had a right to counsel and he had counsel with him. And, and he told the truth. Now, I'm sure this is a traumatic incident. And at the same time, he was under the influence of marijuana, so obviously he wasn't thinking clearly. He didn't have a notepad to take the jot down notes. And we heard the interview. The interview was somewhat confusing at times because the detective Ryan Ho kept asking, no, no, so what happened, you know, the first time you said, she said she was tired. And so Jane is trying to explain the ultimate what happened, the moment he, before he put her into the trunk, she wasn't breathing. And then he's like, no, no. What happened uh, prior to that, when you went to go get the water, when she was feeling tired, when you was like, it was shallow breathing before you waited 15, 20 minutes. So it's kind of confusing as to what time period was he talking about? The moment right before he put her into the trunk? Or when he first noticed the shallow breathing and faint heartbeat, and he gave it about 10, 15 minutes before he came back and then realized that there was no heartbeat and there was no breathing, which he was very consistent on, even though Sergeant Jones left it out of her report. He was very consistent on that. Now, did he have a notepad in his hand to take notes? Did he have a stopwatch to say, okay, exactly nine minutes and 45 seconds has passed from the moment that she said A, B, and C? No, he did not. He tried to remember the best he could, given the traumatic situation. Now... 
he admitted to panicking because he didn't know she had a history of seizures. I mean, he's doing drugs. How many people have been charged? Have you heard people being charged of doing drugs with somebody, providing drugs to somebody, and them being charged with murder? If you give somebody fentanyl or you give somebody some type of drug and they overdose, you're being charged. Now, he's not a lawyer. He doesn't know the ins and outs, but I'm sure we've all heard of stories where either a drug dealer, a drug user, has been charged with murder by sharing drugs with somebody else. So at the point in time, he's paranoid, he panics. He doesn't know what happened. All he knows is he was doing drugs, which is still federally illegal, even though the prosecutor tried to get the special agent to say, oh, I've never heard of nobody being prosecuted. But then again, how would you know? How would you know? You're an FBI agent, you're not a DE agent. The US attorney wouldn't contact you and say, hey, I'm prosecuting somebody for possession of marijuana. I mean, he wouldn't know that. And then a lay person surely wouldn't know this information. So he panicked. Now, the prosecutor wants to suggest that he changed his clothes. Why would he change his clothes? Did he suggest that he changed his clothes because his clothes were all bloody? Is that the suggestion why he changed his clothes? Because there was a very thorough analysis of the house by FBI, by detectives, there was no blood, no DNA, no bodily fluids. He's, I don't know if he's suggesting that she was strangled, where some people release their bodily fluids if being strangled. So I don't know what he's suggesting, especially with the statement that he changed his clothes. He took a shower. Now, surely if your favorite cousin just died in front of you, that would, that would blow my mind. That would have me in a, a, a panic where I'm like, man, I need to gather myself. Like, what just happened? What just happened? And if somebody did research what are the force of attraction, I would possibly do the same thing. Like, man, I, like, did I just do what I thought I did? And then he tried to suggest that there was no conversation about 911. That was obvious. We, talk, we spoke with Lieutenant Sullivan, and he, and he indicated yes. He indicated, yes, he's asked about 911. It's in the transcript. Now, The truth, is being, the truth is not being disclosed the way it should. Exhibit 55. I wish I would have called 911. I ain't know any of that. That's my exact thought. I'm like, okay, call 911. And I'm like, what if they be like, you did this? He panicked. They were speaking of 911. He wasn't thinking in his right mind and he made an improper bad decision. And he thought about it afterwards, like, man, I just, my favorite cousin, I just, I just put her here. So of course you're going to think about what kind of force a trash compactor has? Or what did I just do to my cousin? Like, damn, what did I just do? I mean, he's feeling remorse about it. That's why he eventually came to the police. They didn't come to him. He came to the police and told them. They didn't know this. And then we heard from Sergeant Jones. That was credible what he said. He didn't take him on a wild goose chase. How would he know that she wouldn't be found at the, at the, at the dumpster? I mean, at the uh, trash heap. How would he know that? How would he know that? He didn't take him to an incorrect dumpster. He didn't say, oh, I threw her to a lake. He didn't take him on a wild goose chase. He told them. And they, I guess, believed them because it matched with his phone evidence. It matched the video evidence. Now, when the detective 
who extracted this video, he testified. They tried to show you a car and insinuate that that was Jalen's car. Try to insinuate that this is Jalen's car. Ask him the question, but, oh, this time corresponds with this. It happened to be a white car. But they was hoping that you didn't notice that. But then confronted with, when I confronted the OIC, he's like, oh, yeah, that's the, that's the wrong, that ain't the right car. Yeah, that's not the wrong car. But was that mentioned during the testimony of the detective? No. They tried to insinuate that this was Jalen's car coming back to the scene, checking the trash can, which it was not. And then and now they're trying to say, oh, there's a lot of activity. They got the video camera right on there. Show me. It's hours and hours upon hours of video s s footage of multiple people coming there doing illegal dumping. A lot of people come to these trash cans and illegally dump. If you watch the video, you'll see multitude of individuals coming to the same dumpster, putting things in a trash can. No evidence whatsoever that Jason went back to this particular trash can and looked in. None at all. That's just their hypothesis, their theory, but cannot be supported by any evidence that they have demonstrated at all during this particular trial. Now, if Zion's body was found, there still would not be a conclusive evidence that could be determined that she had a seizure. We heard from Dr. Labadee that if somebody dies of a seizure, there is no way post-mortem, after death, to determine whether or not they died from a seizure. S prosecutor would like you to believe that, oh, they would have been able to find anything. No, not that. Which we believe that is the reason that Zion Foster passed away that particular day. And if somebody's smoking weed or doing drugs and out the, out the blue, somebody just dies from a pre-existing condition that they might not know, I mean, it's reasonable for them to panic. Now, as far as putting the body in the trunk, that was a bad decision. But that does not mean that he caused the death. And the prosecutor has not proven beyond a reasonable doubt that, in fact, Jason caused the death. Because it is very reasonable, based upon the testimony from Vertaz, that he knew she had a history of seizures. Not just one passing out, he knew prior seizures, and they could be worse. We also don't know whether or not in those medical records there is a history of seizures, because nobody thoroughly analyzed it. The detectives didn't, the prosecution didn't. And obviously the doctor whose only job she did not thoroughly analyze, found out on the stand about the drugs. So clearly she didn't look deep enough. And maybe if she had additional time, she would have said, oh, by the way, I do see that she was treated for seizures. But nevertheless, she did indicate that there is history and a probability of it being undiagnosed because some of the symptoms that she was going to the hospital for are attributable to individuals who have seizures. Some of the characteristics she described that particular night, the worst headache in the world, being sounding tired, per Vertez, sounding tired or being very tired, <coughs> per Jalen, consistent with being fatigued, which is a predictal sign of a seizure. Now, had Zion died of a seizure, a natural cause, there would have never been any type of court proceeding. If somebody dies of a natural cause, there's no court proceeding. So if the evidence shows that there's a high probability that she died of a seizure, and if that's reasonable, and it is, 
then the prosecution cannot meet their burden beyond a reasonable doubt because there is reasonable doubt that still exists. Now they want you to go on their theories and their hypotheticals and just sweep under the rug what the doctor said, what Vertez said, try to minimize it. The OIC testified that she spoke to a follow-up interview with Vertez about these seizures. However, this wasn't videotaped, this wasn't recorded. I didn't even know about it to myself to even ex question Vertez about this. This particular important issue of whether or not he had a seizure, you wouldn't record, you wouldn't take notes about this, and you heard him testify in court about having seizures, and not just one, multiple seizures? And you don't think that's important enough to detail? If she died of a seizure, which I believe she did, never we never did we advance suicide. That's we never indicated that. We just indicated there's a possibility that she may have been on other drugs due to her condition of trying to self-medicate. I don't know. We don't know if she was on the other drug. We don't know if there was fentanyl or anything else in it. I don't know if it was an overdose. More than likely, it was a seizure based upon all the conditions and characteristics that we heard. And whether or not Jalen would have noticed that, like I stated, the doctors indicated that some seizures that are deadly and rise above an absent seizure have the same characteristics, such as somebody nodding off and having a seizure. So if there was a seizure, there would be no type of criminal proceeding. So if she died of a seizure, per the law, if Jalen disposed of her after she was already dead and put her in the trunk of the car, he is not disposing of evidence that will be used in a criminal proceeding. Because if it's a seizure, a natural cause, there is no case. There is no penalty over 10 years. If somebody has a heart attack, somebody has a seizure, a brain aneurysm, or whatever the case, there is no criminal proceeding. We also heard that Zion had ehlers Downloads Syndrome, which was a symptom or a condition that affected the cardiovascular system, that affected the heart. We also know she went to the doctor multiple times complaining about heart palpitations and not being able to feel her heartbeat. Doctor also indicated that a seizure could be caused by a cardiovascular. Now the doctor tried to theorize and have a hypothesis that, oh, this Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, EDS, was misdiagnosed. This is, now that's beyond her expertise. She's a forensic pathologist. There's no evidence whatsoever that a doctor misdiagnosed her on this particular condition. There's no evidence that suggests that this particular condition was ever cured. And I believe it was still existing in Zion and it could have been the cause of her seizures and at the very least contributed to her having a seizure, causing her death that particular night. Now, they try to show all these different searches of porn that they say was cousin related. 27 out of 1,154 a year after this happened, after he was incarcerated, after he was in jail, I mean, he was in jail, why wouldn't he look at porn? Now, they didn't want to show you all the other searches. Detective Sergeant Markle, Detective Franti, neither one of them looked at the whole exact extraction report to determine how many porn entries there were. Now, Detective Franci, who wasn't even certified, who wasn't even an expert, why would you even bring him to testify about an extraction and he's not even certified to do it? He testified that he didn't even look at xvideos.com until after he testified. He was sitting in a chair and he went home the night of trial to look 
on X videos to try to verify whether or not how that website works. You were sent this years ago or months ago. What well, actually years ago? This information and you never analyzed it. You never did your job to analyze it. You never went on the website to see whether or not K equals something. You said you went onto a form. You never went to verify it prior. And then you went that particular night, didn't take any notes, didn't take any screenshots. You just allegedly went that particular night to search. They, didn't want you, they don't want you to know the whole truth because it doesn't fit their theory and their hypothesis that Jaden had thousands of porn, super unrelated. And then they try to opine about a quote-unquote rape porn. This is a porn. This is actors in there. We no rape porn. That's why we didn't see it. It's just her opinion. Her opinion of Judge, her ob wife's objection. Opinion. There is a there is a reason we didn't see that, and it is not that. <laughs> Nevertheless, this is her opinion of what it shows. A judge, objection. He can't mischaracterize what the video shows. We, we can't I, show the jury that video. Okay, he, I mean, he's he's just he's making list. a lie, right? I mean, he's he's okay. blatantly lying. All right, no. She detailed what she saw on this particular video. This is her characteristic of this particular video, of what she watched the video, and what her opinion of what the video depicted. Nevertheless, this was over a year after Jaden's last statement in June of 2022. These Porn, regular porn, not no snuff films, nothing illegal, not no child porn, nothing illegal about these searches were over a year later. Jalen's first interview was January 19th. His second interview was January 20th. His last interview was June 10th. Why was he arrested? They want to let you have you believe that there was some smoking gun that came forth in between that time for them to arrest Jalen. Some witness came forward or somebody, some newfound evidence. He told them everything of what they presented then and there. He came in and surrendered and told them, okay, this is what happened. This is what I did in the early onset of this particular investigation. They want you to do their job. Dr. Lavity to do their job. The OIC. Certain things weren't sent. Nobody thoroughly did their job, and it's an investigation to let us know the complete truth. They promised you all these things. They promised you, oh, it's like a bag of Cheetos. If it goes missing, and then you find the crumb, you find the bag, you go question your child, then the, the, their, their hands are covered with Cheetos, or their mouth is covered with Cheetos, and then you assume it's done. Where's, where's the Cheetos on the hands? Where's the Cheetos on the mouth? All they know is the bag is missing. That's all they know, that the Cheeto bag is missing. No evidence that would support any other, other circumstantial. It's just theories and hypotheses. And they want you to be emotionally charged and convict Jalen on insufficient evidence that does not prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he did what he's accused of. So ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you must do your duty. Unlike others in this case, you must find Jalen not guilty. 